So one of the most challenging parts of designing a modern mountain bike is the area around the chain stays and the bottom bracket. We want big tires, we want short chain stays, and we gotta have a chain ring in there also. The old school way of doing it is to simply bend the tubes, maybe dimple them a bit, and then route them into the bottom bracket. Nice and simple. But that's just not good enough for the goals of a modern mountain bike. 29 inch wheels are the standard now. Anything less is a compromise. We also like having wide tires for bikes that are really meant to be thrashed. More traction is always welcome for a serious go fast bike. 32 or 34 tooth chain rings are the, what I feel like are the prevailing sizes out there for what most people run. But of course larger chain rings are sometimes necessary depending on where you ride and how you ride and so on and so forth. But we solve all these problems on a modern bike by using what's known as a chainstay yoke. And that's this guy right here. It's what connects the chainstay tubes to the bottom bracket and gives us all the clearances that we need. Now previously I solved this problem by using one that was readily available online. But recently I wanted to create my own design and maybe do my own small part of moving the frame building world forward while I was at it. Or, in other words, the chainstay yoke is a big obstacle to overcome for those new to building bicycle frames. And so that's why I'm doing this video and putting the drawing up for anyone who needs it. Because when we are designing and building modern mountain bikes, we need to have our cake and eat it too. No more excuses. And so that brings me right into the goals for this project. The goals were to obviously design a chainstay yoke capable of use on modern mountain bikes, but to also keep it capable of being fabricated in the home shop with minimal tooling. So no CNC machines or you know anything like that. It's all very basic, just pieces of plate and a couple of bins. And it can be done with you know an angle grinder, a hacksaw and files if you really wanted to. And also another goal was to have an easily modifiable you know, open source design that encourages changes based on application goals or tools available, so on. And then with that, I'm going to jump right into the design. We're going to head over to my computer on Fusion 360 and show you how I came up with it and then, you know, how you may design one yourself and what things you got to look out for. So here we are inside of Fusion 360. I just wanted to go over the design a little bit, show how I came up with it and you know how you could do something similar for yourself or how you can modify it to suit your application better. So the first thing you need to do before you even start designing something like this is actually figure out what dimensions you need to fit it to. And so for that, if you Google, you know, SRAM frame fit specification or there's probably one for Shimano or whatever you use, pull up this document and then come down to, I'm using the Dub Cranks the GX. So we click on this and everything we need is basically right here. So all of these numbers we can use for the chain ring, for the crank arms, and also for the non-drive side and all these dimensions. And we can use those to make sure that what we're gonna make is actually gonna fit. And so in Fusion 360, I did that based off of just I made different planes offset from the center line of the bottom bracket and then I came through and made a whole bunch of these. So just like this. So you can see here this one represents the inside of the chain ring. This is the outside of the drive side crank. And then here these three represent this page here. So these distances you have to pay attention to. And so once we have these set up it's easy enough to go ahead and start designing and make sure we fit inside it. But in addition to that, being that, you know, one of the goals is fitting the tire in here, we need to figure out what size tire we're going to use and then how big it is and where it's going to be. And so for that, I actually made, well here we can just look at the whole sketch. So this is how I ended up doing it. So I actually have it also set up on the, the functions here with Infusion 360 so I can change it easily. But I just took a few measurements off the tire. So I took, well this is radius, but I measured the diameter of the tire on the outside, the inside, and the width of it, and then I just made a simple curve to help represent it. And then I also have 
the chainstay length right here. So that's our rear axle to the center of the bottom bracket. And so I can actually come in after the fact here under the functions menu. So let's say, you know, the tire width is, say I'm going to use a smaller tire. Well, I can simply come in here, change it real quick, and you see it automatically updates for me. But this setup right here, with these measurements I have, it's a 29 by 2.6 on a 35 millimeter rim. And so that's why you want these actual measurements and you can't just go by that number that's printed on the sidewall because those numbers don't really mean anything. So the best thing you can do is actually just measure out your own tire, that what you have, and then use those for your numbers. But you can see here, and this is, you know, a clearance for mud, but this is one of those things, a lot of it could be tightened up if you really wanted to, for one thing, you know, if you're not running a tire this wide, you could maybe modify the design a little bit. And also for the chain ring, I have it drawn up with a 34 tooth, and you can see plenty of room right here. And so, say you're one of those cross country guys and you want a 36 tooth, well, all you gotta do is make this dimension right here longer, and that's, if we come to the drawing here, this 32 millimeter, you could just make it well, I don't know exactly what it would have to be, maybe 34, and honestly, that's all you would need for a bigger chain ring. And then also, one of the biggest things you may notice right off the bat is the asymmetrical design, because that was one of the first things I did when designing this yoke, is I went with something like this. So here it is actually on the, on the bike. But I went with something like this, you know, symmetrical, because it looks nice, right? Well... The problem with this is that it's the only thing it does is look good, but we're missing out on a whole lot of stiffness because this cutaway here on the right side, that's intended to give us, you know, the chain ring clearance, but obviously we don't have that on the other side. So yeah, it looks nice, but we're putting all this, you know, unsupported vertical piece of metal in the way and it's not really helping us out at all. And so that's why I brought this tube up you know, basically as far as I could before it started interfering with, you know, the bottom bracket and then the non-drive side crank. Again, there's not really a reason to have it symmetrical. So let's take a look at the drawing here real quick and just go over some of the things. And there's a couple weird things on this drawing and I just want to explain those. But the whole idea with this yoke is that we can basically just take two strips of 4130 you know, just 190 thousandths or 3 sixteenths thickness, cut it, put two bends in one piece, weld it all together, and then it's done. And so that's why this isn't normally how you, you know, I would want to put out a drawing, but some of it, for example, over here, I'll show later when I make it, these radiuses here, or radii, I guess, it's, it's a little strange, but the reason I did that is so you can set up, you know, manually when you're laying this out, just scribe the two radii here, put these other lines in the right spot, and then you can cut it out on a bandsaw or cutoff wheel or whatever you have. And so that's what these are for. And then over here you notice on this bent piece, we have a 35 degree bend. That's for both sides. So we just bend one, bend the other. And then also notice the tolerancing here. So this 32 millimeter, that's the important one because that's our chain ring clearance, but these others, and you'll see again when I, when I go to actually make this thing, I made them longer. And this side obviously we're mitering. And then back here, you know, I made it long, welded on, and then I ended up sanding and finishing it down. And so these, I would just consider these your absolute minimums. Same idea over here, the 71, that's basically just your minimum. And then also notice this 38 degree. That's the angle that it actually sits on this bottom bracket. And it's the same thing for both sides here. How I have it pictured here, with some of these, I just did a bunch of chamfers until it looked kind of okay. But you'll see the way I did it in the, you know, in the real world ended up quite a bit different. And that's something that's totally up to you. I mean, we're just trying to make it look a little bit nicer and, you know, I guess maybe remove a little bit of weight also. So now that is the design. And for many of you out there, I imagine that's probably enough and that's all you need to get started, you know, to go ahead and build one of these for yourself. But the rest of this video is I'm going to show how I made it. You know, the tools that I have, how I cut everything, grind it to shape, welded it, fixtured it, all that good stuff. So if you want to see that, stick around for the rest of it.
So the first step is I want to show how I cut out the what I'm calling the brace in the middle. And here's how you could do it manually. So you see I put some layout fluid on it and I'm setting up a compass so I can scribe those two radii. And then of course just a center punch mark to hold it so we can scribe it. And this is what I was saying why I put that on the drawing because you can just scribe the two radii and then come in, you know, draw out the center line distances and the edges and then cut it out. But you may also see on the plate there to the left, I actually just had access to a CNC plasma cutter, so I cut them out that way and a little bit faster and simpler that way, but again, this is how you can do it yourself at home. And so there you go. There's the comparison between the two. But here's what I was just talking about. It's very fast and easy. CNC plasma is it's not very good and it's not very accurate for a lot of stuff. But for something like this that we're going to do some cleanup work on, it's, it's good enough. And there you can see what I'm talking about, all that leftover slag and, you know, just nasty stuff from the cutting. So we've got to get rid of all that. I'm using the belt grinder to do that here. And here's a close-up. You notice all that slag in the where it's been cut every bit of that needs to be removed you know maybe not the end of the world for 4130 but it's always best practice to get rid of that before you do any welding whatsoever and here's the other part of that plate just using a cutoff wheel to cut a one inch wide strip and that's going to make up the two side plates and then i cut them to length on a I got a port of band here on a, with the swag off-road stand. And here's a pro tip. All your cutoff bits, before you put it in the scrap bin, mark what it is. <laughs> that way you can grab them like, oh look, 4130, there we go. So here we go, mark my two center lines for the bend. And then in just a second, I'm gonna show you my setup here. Very simple. That's just the Harbor Freight 20 ton shot press. And then you can see the actual bending tooling that I have. And it's as simple as lining up the center line with the, you know, the point on the, the bending die there. Press it down until it's good enough. And that's it. But you can see here I screwed it up. Went too far. So, no big deal. Let me show you how I fix that. Do it the Neanderthal way. We put it in the vise. Grab a pair of adjustable, you know, adjustable wrench and then we can you know squeak it back into 35 degrees and that is close enough for me now here's the jig I made to hold it together just very simple out of scrap aluminum I had laying around I drilled all the holes on the mill with the DRO so it's set up at the was it 38 degrees on both sides now I can take the two side pieces and the center brace and put it all in there and I just use some, you know, very basic vice grips to clamp everything together because, you know, all I needed was to just be able to get some good tacks on it, hold that center brace at the right height, and again, make sure I had the two different, you know, 38 degrees set up nicely. And that's pretty much it right there. Just got to squeeze in there and get a few tack welds in. And now after I tacked it, go ahead and start welding. This is my attempt at getting a nice arc shot while I'm welding, but I really need to get some neutral density filters or something for my camera because it's still still too bright. Now to miter it on the mill, you see I already have these large jaws, but they're still not big enough for this yoke. So you can see there I just took the other jaws from the vise and used those to hold it and it worked out just, just fine. Now here's a problem. We end up hitting the end of the hole saw there. So, easiest solution to that is this right here. <laughs> Just come in there, cut off the extra, and then you can come right down and finish up mitering it. You don't have to buy the you know, special deep cut hole saws or anything like that. It's no big deal. So there it is mitered up. And you may also notice I have it offset. You know, just bringing it down just a little bit makes everything flow together nicer on the bike. and. You know, it gives, gives you a little bit more room to work with on the top side, too, for the down tube and seat tube and all that. And you could probably go even further if you wanted. You just have to 
give yourself some more material to miter. So here it is just welding it out. Yes, I do use a sugar scoop welding hood. That's my favorite. Don't judge me, it's the best. But yeah, we just finish up welding it and then after that I'm going to show you just matching it up with the chain stays and starting to grind it in. And so I'm actually using, you know, the Skynet fixture to go ahead and set it up. So the you know easiest way to do it, I made myself some dummy lines here. Once I had the rough length in and had my chainstay length set up on the table, is I went over back to the belt sander and I made myself I just clamped down two pieces of aluminum here that I set to that, you know, 30 what is it 38 degree angle and so that gave me a guide so I can just take the whole breadboard tooling that I have for my chain stays and feed it into the belt sander and really once I started getting close you know just going back and forth once I started getting close to my dummy lines there I just walked over to the fixture you know loaded the axle in and then I just see you know, like in this case, I need to take a little more off the bottom. And so it's just a bunch of back and forth, but really that's, you know, probably one of the easiest ways to do it. Then after that, once I'm happy with the fit up, I deburred it and then tack it in place. And don't be an idiot like me, you know, tacking without gloves. I'll immediately burst into flames or something like that. And then after I'm happy with some really, you know, heavy tacks on it, I go ahead and take the fixture off. And that gives me the opportunity to get some more weld on it. And the astute among you may also notice it's upside down. You know, I have the drive side up. And that was just so I could fit the fixturing in there better. But all you have to do, since it's basically almost symmetrical, we can flip it over to the correct orientation now. And it's essentially the same thing. Clamping it in, there we go and then I just went ahead and finished up welding it. Now you notice here I left those ends you know overhanging and square so after I got a whole bunch of weld I swapped over to a that's a 36 grit belt and then I just started taking off lots of the extra material until we got something like this. Once I got that you can see that portion that's not welded now I went in there and just welded over basically just fusing it together not really caring about how it looks I'm just trying to join the the yoke to the to the tube there and once we have that I'll go ahead and finish it out and make it look pretty so you see there that's yeah ugly weld but again it's going to disappear here in just a second and this is also what I mentioned it's it's up to you you know there are other ways that you could finish it make it look different but I just kind of went for rounding it over like this and then you know before it gets on the finished bike I'll go back over with a, something like a 220 grit belt and really make it look better and so that's going to cover it for how I built this chainstay yoke and of course this chainstay sub-assembly that I'm showing I'll sneak in a few pictures of the totally finished product that I put on a on a bike but that's going to cover it for today so thanks for watching